Thank you, Trevor, for telling us about the new developments in AmeriPlex. We'll um, quickly move to our first plenary session, which is called Bringing the Americas Together. We have uh, one keynote uh, talk and three short talks. Um, I will ask uh, first our keynote speaker, Dr. Arturo Sanchez uh, Asofeita, if he can start uh, sharing um, his screen. Um, Dr. Sanchez Asofeita is a professor at the Earth and Atmospheric Sciences Department uh, at the Faculty of Science, University of Alberta. He's the director of the University Center for Earth Observation uh, Sciences. His research focuses on understanding how tropical dry forest ecosystems respond to climate change. Uh, his work also explores uh, linkages between the different biophysical variables and remote sensing observations. Uh, his talk today is called uh, A Vision on the Estimation of Photosynthetic Arctic Radiation Using Sensor Networks. So um, just a quick uh, announcement. We set a timer. Um, so this will sound three times. Uh, First time when uh, you have two minutes um, uh, before your time is up, then the second one will be when uh, 20 minutes are over, and the last one is when the 25 uh, minute slot is uh, is up. Okay, so please um, go ahead, Arturo. Thank you very much, Jorge. Um, good morning, everybody, and I want to thank the people from Ameriflux for the invitation to, to give this keynote speech. Uh, buenos días a todos mis colegas latinoamericanos de habla española. Buen día a todos mis colegas brasileiros. Um, I hope that everybody is doing well across the Americas in these pandemic times. Um, today, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the experience that we have about the characterization of photosynthetic active radiation using sensor networks. So there is a topic that uh, in general is now well explored because we focus so much in carbon fluxes. And, um, and uh, the, the, when I was actually thinking about uh, this presentation, uh, one of the things that came to me was a book by Jim Gray, the, the former the scientist in Microsoft, that wrote a book a few years ago called The, the Fourth Paradigm of Science. And, uh, and the, basically the, the key element that, and I think that is something that has come across in this meeting as well, is the, the need to conduct new synthesis. And uh, we see it with some of the software that has been developed by, by Ameriflux and so forth. And uh, it basically shows that the science of environmental monitoring is evolving, evolving as well as the technology that supports it. So the question is how we conduct new synthesis besides just writing scientific papers. And uh, the second thing is that uh, with this new technology, a new comes new equipment and new data sets. And, and then we come to the point uh, so where we have so much data to, to manage, to analyze, to visualize terabytes of information. And in that regard, sometimes I feel that there are specific areas in society that evolve faster than others. For example, how can it be possible that today it's so difficult to connect a carbon flux system to an app in the internet and see, for example, and evaluate uh, trends and so forth. Meanwhile, I can go to my investments in the stock exchange and actually can go in an app and I can see if my stocks is coming up and down and so forth. And there are trillions of, of terabytes of data being integrated. So we are falling behind, but it, we are going into the direct direction. Now, at the end of the day, we have the problem of the synthesis. We have the, the amount of information that we have. And then we have the, the, the sphere of policy making. And, uh, and then we ask ourselves, how can we accurately communicate environmental trends using clear language? If you need to go to a COP meeting or to present to your minister of the environment in, in all Latin American countries, if you start talking about carbon fluxes and, and, and PAR, and they, in five minutes, they're actually in their phones looking at, at, at other things. So we need to start making an effort to communicate the science of environmental monitoring in a clear language. And I'm very happy to see that there are some sessions in this meeting aimed at, the, at that specific component. So what is happening is that 
when we look at the, the fourth paradigm of science, we are realizing that our environment is getting smarter. We're getting our systems that are more instrumented. What we can see, unfortunately, there is a 500 and something sites. But when we look at the distribution, everything is in the United States. And like we say in Costa Rica, with cuatro gatos or four cats in Latin America. So we are very, we have a very centralized North American vision of, of how carbon is. But the fundamental issue is also that, that our sites are becoming instrumented, our sites are becoming interconnected when we have a monitoring system that are more advanced, and those systems are becoming more intelligent. So the way that we are doing science is, has changed significantly over the last few years when we have more smart sites and, uh, and that can allow us to share more information to deal with operations or, or deal with trends and so forth. So why I'm so interested in PAR uh, and, and FPAR, uh, the, the EOS committee uh, set up PAR as, as something that we call an essential climatic variable. And uh, it's a very interesting data set that can help us to understand vegetation health and uh, also to, to quantify uh, faster the response of vegetation to interseasonal changes and climate change without in many cases the need to have a, a carbon flux system but can give us a sense of, um, of what the trend is. And this is how, for example, how the Mesoamerica look like. Um, the fundamental question is, this is a NASA product how accurate this is. What means zero, what means one, is this accurate or not? So our project uh, here at the University of Alberta and with colleagues in, in, in across the Americas has aimed to develop technologies that can help us to better estimate the accuracy of these sites and also to understand a little bit better what do we know about the, the variance associated with the FPAR. The systems are very simple. We have incoming light that transmits to the vegetation, and then we have a network of sites in the bottom that in many cases uh, are either connected to the internet or they are downloaded by people um, that goes and collect individual data sets. So this is an example of uh, the information that we have in the Santa Rosa National Site in Costa Rica. Uh, it's a Rios, CEO's super site. And uh, when we have blue, we have the little sensors in the field and uh, the green ones are aggregators that collect the information. And basically what is happening is they send information to an aggregator uh, and then to uh, uh, via satellite or via phone to uh, Environet at the University of Alberta. And then we can actually uh, link and observe data uh, almost in real time, depending on the site. And it can help us to understand processes and uh, the most important, the calibration of remote sensing uh, data sets. Um, we have gone through many different types of technology developments. We have, uh, they go by, by the color of the box. And, uh, and we have the first system that we deployed in Brazil where um, a black boxes, then we have the yellow boxes, and then we have the blue boxes that, as you can see right here, they have, uh, their own uh, uh, photo cells for energy, and uh, they have bits of artificial intelligence. Uh, each one of those have wireless sensing transmission capabilities, and that uh, they have uh, a PAR, temperature, relative humidity, and soil moisture probes that uh, can help us to understand a little bit more concepts of microclimates. Uh, the, the way that we deploy this has been a, an issue of uh, many years of discussion, and. And it is how we can actually uh, be able to, to maximize the data collection. And uh, either some people may be interested in transects, other people may be interested in concentric information, either around uh, the, the tower site or the, uh, the footprint of the, of, of the tower on an agreed system. Uh, or, or group has been working on, on the development of a uh, techniques that allow us to maximize the, the location of uh, and information that is collected by each sensor. And uh, in, in this, in, we have come with this element of using hexagons. So this is uh, a deployment that we have in Australia uh, in the rural super site. I'm really not sure yet 
if this got burned last year, but I think that it was, and that this is the carbon flux, and this is the footprint of the tower, and then this is the deployment that we have when we have max, maximum coverage of the footprint uh, based on the uh, distance between sensors and light. And that actually what we are doing right now is trying to, to develop tools that can allow us to um, uh, understand the, the, the spatial autocorrelation of light. So the measurement of each one of those sensors is uh, independent, which is extremely important for fusion analysis. Finally, uh, all the data comes into environment.org. Uh, there is already three versions of this uh, site uh, from a very humble beginnings a few years ago, but uh, they can allow us to visualize, retrieve, upload, and do management tools for the data that we have uh, across the globe uh, in, in part information. So this has been a, a long process that is taking us about uh, 15 or years or more. Uh, where we went all the way for concept development and analytics development of that analytics platform. Then initial tests in Brazil and Australia, uh, more development of a barnet. Then in the last uh, a few years, we have been doing international deployments uh, in Costa Rica, Canada, Mexico, Brazil, Panama, Argentina. Uh, let me see if I can remember well, Australia, Singapore, um, Germany and um, the UK. So we are right now in the processing of developing new analytic tools with the help of IBM and also the development of new analysis to actually understand the effectiveness of many uh, remote sensing platforms to characterize power. This is an example of our, uh, our work along the years in Latin America and in Canada. Um, where we have data all the way from Argentina to Canada with the exception of the United States. I'm going to focus today on the Santa Rosa National Park Environmental Monitoring Super Site that is located in Northwest Costa Rica. This is a broad deciduous forest, a tropical dry forest uh, in the strict uh, use of the word. Um, we have been working there for since 2013 with sensing technologies, but it goes back to 1998 with environmental monitoring systems. Uh, there we have uh, around more than uh, 60 nodes that collect uh, fire information every 10 minutes. And also we have uh, uh, three, uh, three uh, carbon flux systems, as you guys can see here, uh, separated more than uh, less than one kilometer among the towers. And uh, the fundamental goal of this is to start looking at uh, both temporal and, and spatial variance of carbon fluxes uh, systems. This is an example of uh, what we can obtain through the understanding of a, a, a FPAR and wireless sensor networks. This is for the Santa Rosa super site uh, and how this compares with uh, individual FAPAR measurements by Sentinel-2. And uh, it's fundamentally clear that uh, we have significant differences between what we are observing in, in the field and what we are observing in terms of uh, the uh, a satellite data. So satellite algorithms starting to fail, significantly fail uh, in the estimations of regional part, at least in tropical dry forest environments. Remains to be seen what happens in, in other tropical ecosystems, especially in the Amazon, like or, or montane forests, uh, where you have a higher LAI saturation and not a high level of seasonality. But at least what we are observing right now is that they at least we have a significant uh, uh, differences between remote sensing observations and, uh, and uh, um, wireless sensor network data collected. The same thing can be said about uh, um, our observations with MODIS. Uh, this is a, a normalized data for aqua and terra for eight day collections. And uh, the, the easy to have part that you guys can see there in green. And uh, as you can see, the, 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 the system works very well. We have a, a dry season, then you have the status of the rain, the start of the rain, and then you have a, in a matter of eight days, you have full leverage, and then you have these events. Some of them may be considered uh, a microclimate events, but all changes in microclimate because of the dry seasons in the middle of the, of the rainy season, but also um, 
uh, we'll see later on, we think that there can be other things uh, that we are observing. And, uh, and this mess right here, this uh, um, uh, spaghetti diagram that doesn't fit the, what we are seeing the ground is the, the observations from, uh, uh, from MODIS. And uh, we can see that for the specific times uh, of the year, there is up to 41% difference between the MODIS observations and the data in the ground. So it questions a lot uh, the accuracy of these systems uh, like uh, in Sentinel-2. Uh, one of the major problems with the estimation of FPAR with models is the use of land cut tables. And um, it, the, the, another thing is that the tropical dry forest uh, ecosystems are ranked as savannas. So it, it causes a, a, in their models a, a, an underestimation of FPAR and, and basically products are extremely difficult to, to analyze. And I, I have serious concerns when we see global papers that do not take into consideration this kind of problems. So my question is what is reality and what is just a, 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 the product of, of, of issues associated to, to poor a, algorithms for data extraction. Another thing that uh, probably people have not look at is what happened with, with FAPAR and the, and the detection of other uh, variables and, and, and I think that one of the most interesting things that we have found is the, the influence of, a, of FPAR by, by wind speed. And, uh, and one of the things that we have observed this consistently on our sites in Germany, in the UK, in Canada, and in Costa Rica, is that as wind speed increases, there is an increase in the standard deviation, but also a decrease in the mean if part being calculated. And that there is a threshold around five meters per second where actually a, a, everything goes loose. So we have been recommending in some of our publications that uh, wind speed must be part of uh, activities associated to uh, a measurement of F part and actually filter uh, a data of F part over five meters per second because of the bias added to the, to the data sets. So the question is what, what the future holds on the estimations of, of FPAR. And I think that this is a, a very interesting example of how FPAR can be actually used beyond the, the support of, of the estimations of flux systems. Uh, this is a, a from Minas Gerais in Brazil. And uh, if you look at the, uh, the if it, uh, the FPAR uh, intercepted by canopy over a year, you're gonna have the dry season, then it rains around the mid-November and it, the, the, it goes up. And if it is a normal year, the, the, the productivity will go like this. Um, then the wireless sensor allows us to see this variability. This is basically forest structure during the dry season. You can see that the, all the sites starting to, to clean up at the same time. And all of a sudden, one site drops significantly. This is the result of a, an insect attack. That basically, what it does is that uh, the, the herbivory there creates holes in the leaves, hundreds of leaves with holes. And basically, what it does is creates more transmittance of light. The insect stuff disappears, and then the forest recuperates, and then the sensors come back to normal. And then, this is also a very interesting element that we were very lucky. Uh, there was a, a very uh, unusual a storm that uh, uh, threw trees away, uh, causes significant damage, was captured by the wireless sensor network, and, and, and that was the significant drip. You can see the effect of the storm on different systems. And then the mean, the forest tried to recuperate a little bit, was never able to, to recuperate, went down, into senescence early and reach a bottom at the end. So by looking at years of normal productivity and years of defect, we can actually have an idea of how much we are losing. The final aspect is uh, how do we look at fire in more comprehensive way, just not forests, but we know that tropical forests have trees, have lianas, have palms, and many different elements that must be considered. In my case, I'm very interested in lianas that are parasites that can arrest succession and increase tree mortality. But it's something more important 
that in the neotropics, 43 to 86% of all the trees have lianas. And uh, we have not looked in the scientific literature about this. So how PAR is affected by the presence of lianas? This is a, an example of, of a sort of a wireless sensor data in Costa Rica when we have uh, nine uh, uh, plots that we are uh, having a, a very intense liana removal experiment. And in red, you see sites that uh, uh, don't have lianas and in blue sites with lianas. And uh, we can see that, for example, during the senensis time, the park can decrease. Uh, there are differences of up to 37%. Meanwhile, during the growing season, we have a uh, four to eight percent difference. And actually something very interesting that uh, Kalaska found in 2005 is the lianas stay longer and we can see the differential process of shifting uh, on FA par as a result of lianas. So there are different hypotheses that suggest that lianas are becoming more dominant in the tropics um, as a result of climate change. And it could be possible that part systems can actually help us to validate that change in dominance over time. So I think that my final remarks are uh, oriented to think, pay people away, uh, to think about some changes in scientific and in technological paradigms combined with technological approaches that can help us to better understand essential climatic variables such as PAR, uh, the possibility considering wireless sensing networks observations that can help us to be more critical of remote sensing algorithms through intensive uh, calibration and validation. And then the need to start um, uh, developing more comprehensive FPAR systems that can help us to, to, to better understand ecosystem system, uh, services and, uh, and, and satellite missions. Thank you very much. And I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Arturo. I'm sorry that the, the, the timer didn't uh, make the sound, but uh, we have four uh, minutes for questions. So um, uh, yeah, if you can uh, please raise your hand in the participants um, window, or you can write your question in the chat room. And I will give you um, space to ask your question to Arturo. Please go ahead, don't be shy. Okay, I have uh, one question in the meantime, Arturo. Um, I, I see that you have uh, instruments placed in different um, uh, places uh, in, in, in America. Um, how many more sites do you, would you like to have um, in specific places or you would uh, need to have like every single site instrumented to have a really accurate um, prediction of uh, FPAR? Um, we, we, we have, we are very interested in dry forest ecosystems. I think that they, they, we have sites in Northern Minas Gerais. We would like to expand to, into Kapinga systems. Uh, a, and uh, sometime a few years ago, we tried to do something with mix flux or Mexico flux, but it was not possible. So uh, we decided to continue working uh, on this. The next step that we are trying to do is a, a transect uh, from, from in Costa Rica all the way from uh, the ocean to the top of the volcanoes uh, with sensor networks that allow us to look at uh, changes in life zones. Um, but uh, they, that's pretty much what we like to, to do at this stage. Uh, uh, one of the main problems is, uh, is, is, is uh, communications and, and energy systems uh, that can affect uh, the transmission. So the, we, we try to be sure that we have got burned many times because of the, of people forget about the networks or, or, and so forth. So we are trying to focus right now in Santa Rosa and, and, and in Costa Rica across this gradient that we are developing. Yeah, we have uh, many so, questions now. Ben Rankul says, uh, can you talk about trade-offs of cost and sensor quality? Yes, uh, I, the, we have been trying to, to, to go to many costs, either from the ones that you buy in China 
that you get uh, part sensors that you can actually cut with your scissors and build yourself uh, to uh, the expensive ones. I think that probably the, the, the best ones that we have work so far, hands down, are the Apogee sensors. And this is not a, a, a paid uh, a, a commercial, but uh, they have been working very well for us. Uh, I think that the key element here is a, not the sensor, but to have a program that looks at drifting of the sensors using metrology. And uh, a, working with Joanne Nottingale in the UK National Physics laboratory, most of the sensors that we have are validated against standard sensors calibrated by them. So we can actually look at, at the, uh, at the um, quality of the sensor over time. And the Apogee has been actually working very well, even two, three years after they're installed, we, less, more, we get less than 2% drifting. But you have, to have, you have to be very careful on this. We have other questions here. We have 30 uh, seconds uh, for yeah. the last question. Are you Rose seeing? asked, what would be, what you say is the biggest hole in our flux observations across Latin America? Um, there are many uh, issues, but uh, one, one thing that I will say, dry forests and montane forests, uh, cloud forests too as well. Uh, there are many holes, but uh, uh, some of the dry forests that we have data in, in Mexico and, and in Brazil, they are not dry forests per se, they're like transitions to either savanna or deserts. And uh, I think the dry forest is probably one of the biggest holes that the flux has. That's it, thank you. Sorry, I couldn't you. answer all these questions, but I will try to, to respond yes, them by texting. But as, as in a normal meeting, I think you can uh, get um, to meet at the break uh, in gather. So um, hopefully you will get an answer for those questions. Thank you, Arturo. We'll have uh, to move to the next um, talk, which is a short talk um, by um, Aurelio Guevara Escobar. Um, Dr. Guevara Escobar is a professor and researcher at the Faculty of Natural Sciences, uh, the Autonomous University of uh, Querétaro in Mexico. Uh, Aurelio, if you can start sharing your screen, please. You have uh, 15 minutes and I will tell you uh, when um, uh, 11 minutes have passed, so you'll know that you have uh, two more minutes to finish your talk. Hello, everyone. My name is Aurelio Guevara, and uh, today I would like to share with you some ideas about the work we have done and uh, the results uh, from the past 20 years or so at the, the University of Querétaro in, in Mexico. First, um, maybe you, you have seen this diagram but please consider the following. At each level, energy is transferred in some way. First we have radiation, then we have chemical energy, and then other kinds of energy transfer. It could be work or financial. Uh, it is important to understand that we have to look at all, all, all these levels at the same time in the when we, we, we look at the efficiency in, in energy transfer. For instance, here you, here you can see different shapes of, of triangles. The base of the, these triangles represents the differences in natural resource base for any given ecosystem. This resource base is basically the capacity of uh, how much energy can be captured. And the height of the triangle represents the energy transfer in a space or time, not only across different, different levels of energy use. Therefore, uh, the first, the first uh, small triangle could be a semi-arid environment. 
where the resource base is small and therefore there are few levels of for further energy transfer. The second triangle could be an agro ecosystem where the resources are more plentiful. Now, um, energy is transferred in ascending levels. Always, always there is a trade-off when you transfer energy to another level and uh, the amount of energy is decreased. We, of course, we can use external resources like uh, nutrients, like water, like money, time, or workforce to compensate, to compensate um, the constraints of each ecosystem. This is the paradigm of the green revolution. But uh, each, time, each time we, we use an external resource, we cause externalities. It, and probably the more important thing to remember is that native vegetation would be the most efficient uh, kind of the vegetation for any energy capture from the sun. And uh, of course, we have to keep in mind how these primary production could be used in, in other levels. And this is important because then we, we can understand if we as humans should consume beef or milk or, or, or simply veggies. And probably that's not the answer. This is Querétaro. In Querétaro, we have three main types of landscape, which is the Sierra Gorda, which is mainly forest, coniferous forest, mixed forest, and tropical forest. We have all these kinds of forests. Then the semi-desert, which is what you are looking at right now. And in here we have different types of rangelands. Then comes the central valleys, uh, where agriculture urban and industrial development is, is very important. Central Bali is expanded into the, into, into the Bajio, which is a very large area. It's booming right now and comprises more than 10 cities. So what people do in the, in the Bajio it affects many, many environments. Uh, this is uh, an early days example of what we did probably is 200, 2002 or 2003. In Querétaro, um, we pump a lot of water. Probably we are running out of water. Probably we are pumping from 140, 180 meters deep. And uh, people is, is worried about how we can use that remaining water. Uh, in this case, um, Querétaro has a, a rainfall um, probably about 500 to 700 mils a year. And uh, in, the, in this slide, I, I show you different planting, planting schemes for maize. Yield in these conditions is about 16 to 18 tons, which is very good. And uh, we were testing susu phase drip irrigation, mulches and, and uh, different varieties of, of corn. Uh, the instrumentation was a bovine station, a bovine radio station. And we found out that we could reduce uh, water uses by 20%, which is very good in these conditions. Alfalfa, alfalfa probably is the most important forage in Mexico. And for many reasons, because it's a legume, it uh, fixes nitrogen, has deep roots, and it's a perennial. So many, many people like this, this plant as a grazing paddocks for hay or silage. You can use it in different ways. And uh, again, here we are looking at surface drip irrigation, uh, 
compared to sprinkler irrigation, we, we, had, we got about 30% better water usage. And um, people were impressed by these results. Another example we look at was um, natural vegetation. Mesquite is, is very common in, in Querétaro. And uh, here the question was, how was the, part, the rainfall partitioning in, in this time, kind of vegetation? And uh, we found out that in rainfall interception is very important. Uh, we consider that it's important because it reduces the amount of useful rainfall for the plants or for recharge. In this case, uh, this canopy could hold up to one, one millimeter. Um, it was the, the storage capacity of this uh, canopy. And altogether, uh, it could reduce by 20 to 30% the, the, the gross rainfall. With, uh, again, with the Bowen, we found out that uh, evapotranspiration was in the range of three to four millimeters a day. Well, in, in the example of the mesquites, we were looking at managed uh, trees of shrubs. And this is very important because we have to keep um, the, the leaves into reach of the animal so that they, 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 they can be browsed by the, by the animal. And this is important because people will want to have some revenue from, from their paddocks. If management is not right, well, um, the tree will grow and we, we can't we can use it in, in, in an economic way. This idea came from another environment. This, this picture shows Western Australia. It is another plant, it's not mesquite. But the, the important thing to remember that in Mexico and in Latin America, we have a lot of native plants that are thornless and so they, they know they, they are not pricky and can be used very more efficiently uh, for browsing in comparison to, to mesquite. Another theme that we look at was uh, some epithetic plants that you can find in, in, in the forest. This is balmos. And balmos is a problem in many forests because it can overgrow the, the canopy and even kill the, the trees. This plant is not a, a parasite. It, it doesn't have a functional roots. But um, the question was, how, how does this plant get the, the water it needs for survival. And we look at, at, the, at the storage capacity of rainfall and fog, and fog is very important. Uh, in another studies, we, we, we found out that during the night there was uptake of, of um, vapor and water from these different um, anatomic parts of the of the plant, and this was the mechanism that was uh, used by Balmos to to get water into the plant. So we used simulations and field studies to to get this this information. And um, two minutes left. Two minutes. Okay. It's been a, a step learning curve. Right now we have a, an ethical covariance tower and we have to get um, 
up to date with another techniques to process the data, implement different uh, complementary measurements like soil water balance, like TDR groups, like uh, subflow to complement the information that the eddy covariance tower give us. At the beginning, we, we thought that the eddy covariance was a very, a very good idea that we could get good information straight from the, the, this system, but that was not the case. There are more questions to be answered than the answers that provided the, the, the systems of, of eddy covariance. So we are looking at how to improve our measuring system and get better information. For the students, uh, we have a sandbox where they can test different ideas and then work along with the research site and try to find out uh, important things for them. Uh, students are very creative and they can, they, they have uh, developed their, their own measuring systems and, and that was very impressive for, for us to, to know. So uh, this is the, the way we work at uh, Querétaro, working with the students so we can improve uh, the understanding of the system. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Aurelio. Um, we have uh, time for questions. You can uh, either raise your hand, the participants window, or um, type it in the in the chat room, the chat window. Um, um, here's a question for you, Aurelio. It says, I'm curious about your student sandbox approach. Is that fair with the field course or fundamentals course? This is by Marguerite uh, Moritz. Uh, uh, not yet, not yet. The sandbox, the purpose of the sandbox is that they can try um, different um, schemes for instrumentation and find out how evaporation works. And, uh, and then the good students go to the field and to the experimental sites uh, and uh, well, they, they, can, they can learn some other things. It's like a, a starting point, I, I would think. Okay, um, thank you. Um... I think we will uh, move to the next presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Aurelio, uh, for your presentation. Um, you can uh, stop sharing your, the screen now. Next talk okay. is um, Dr. Enrico Yepes. Um, he's a professor and researcher at the Department in Water um, and Environmental Sciences at the Technological Institute of Sonora in Mexico. Uh, his talk uh, will be about carbon and water flux assessment at seasonally dry ecosystems of northern, uh, northwestern Mexico. I will let you know, Enrico, when you have uh, two minutes left. Yes, thank you, Jorge. And thank you, everybody, in this meeting for the invitation, the organizers, of course. This is a great opportunity for us to present some of the work that we've been carrying in Mexico regarding flux measurements. Uh, we have been conducting some, some interesting work, important work that now we're ready to share with the Ameriflux community. And that's some of the ideas that I would like to discuss today. Since we're talking about bridge in the Americas, we must talk about Mexico because this is probably an important bridge that we can use to, to make this connection that we've been wanting to pursue for the Americas. So and talking about Mexico and the opportunities and challenges that in this country we have to accomplish flux measurements. We can think on a country that has about 2,000 square kilometers of area with a population of about 130 million people. It's a mega diverse country which has a strong, strong seasonality you know, throughout the country pretty much. 
And it has an extensive coastal area, which brings some very interesting ecosystems to, to the game and to study. And we have a very complex orography, two sierras and a center volcanic belt, which brings a, an, an important complexity to our system. Uh, interestingly, we found the northernmost limit of some key ecosystem that occur in the Americas. We'll talk about this a little longer. Uh, Mexico has a very dynamic landscapes. You know, uh, we have an important population. We have an enormous amounts of natural resources. These are being used to provide ecosystem services and and, and and goods for the for the for the people. So our landscapes are fragmented. You know, we have a mosaic of successional states that bring an extra layer of complexity to our systems. But it's what sometimes motivates us to study this. Um, the, the, this uh, ecosystem from the point of view of the carbon and water fluxes. Uh, lately, we've been able to do some assessment like countrywide assessment, where we've been trying to centralize and, and compile the field observations that we've been doing across the country in terms of the carbon and, and water fluxes. And not, not only the fluxes, but also the stocks, and the dynamics of these stocks as the country has been changed throughout the different ecosystems. We've been doing this lately with the Programa Mexicano del Carbono, which is this academic entity that has gathered scientists to, to conduct these goals. This assessment have offered us a you know, platform to start asking more advanced questions on the dynamics of these carbon and water stocks that we have in the, in the country. And this is where the MEXFLUX, the Mexican Network for Eddy Covariance Fluxes has come to a play in Mexico. Now we've been trying to accommodate our research to answer these important questions related to the carbon and carbon dynamics across the country. So this is just a, an schematic of what we, of the sites, some around 14 sites that we gather information and fluxes. You know, from first efforts on compiling this information have been, carrying, have been carried across the country. We're in the process of cleaning and compiling better this information so it can be available to conduct a more advanced studies. You can see that in this country, you know, most of the uh, edicovarian sites are biased, if you want to say it, toward the northern part of the, of the country in this uh, region that I'm marking here with the, with the red square. And this has a reason. So this has a lot to do with the pioneering work that Dr. Chris Watts now at the University of Sonora has been doing it with basically um, inviting Mexico to start conducting flux measurements. And he chose this part of the country. And I now I think understand why he did that because the Northwestern Mexico is a unique natural laboratory to start conducting ecosystem measurements. We have uh, and a region that has several different ecosystems that are all very seasonal. The North American monsoon basically brings the, the, the summer rains and it's a very active part of the year, which are pretty much brings the water and the, on the carbon fluxes that occur in this, in, this system, in this area. We have, we can go from the coast to the mountain and this makes a very interesting scenario to conduct gradient and pair studies. We, as I was saying, in this part of the country, the, northern, the, the northernmost limit of ecosystems like the tropical dry forests that Arturo was talking about and mangroves occur in this part of the country and this part of the Americas. And of course, there are present anthropogenic activities that are bringing this extra complexity to the, to the system. So among these sites, and I'm talking more on the sites that really the efforts from the Instituto Tecnológico de Sonora, the University of Sonora, and some support from Arizona State University have put the, some of these sites. So I'm going to show briefly about these three sites, uh, subtropical shrubland and no woodland and a secondary tropical dry forest that had been collecting flux data for a while that you started later and in the middle of the last decade. You now these sites are not active anymore. They produce several years of data. There have been some publications that came out. We had found interesting contrast in these ecosystems. They've been used to assess and calibrate 
and hydrologic and ecosystem process simulations. So that we've been learning quite a bit of these systems are again, highly, highly seasonal. Uh, some of these two you probably heard about them in the compilation that uh, Biedermann and, and Ross did a, a couple years ago, where these two sites, two of these sites were used, the secondary tropical dry forest and the subtropical uh, shrubland. These two sites lay in the part where a lot of uncertainties are in the, if these systems are sources or sink of carbon. So this is basically just opening an uh, important questions for us to keep monitoring this system and getting, getting a better grasp on how the, the flux dynamics are occurring in these systems. Uh, I wanted to mention these three sites were formally <clears throat> engaging with Ameriflux to upload this uh, data from these sites to the Ameriflux database. And in the next few weeks, we hope that this uh, data will be available for the community. Uh, uh, a, a story that I have to, to tell because it's where most of my lab group has centered the attention in the last in the last years <clears throat> is in the, the study of the tropical dry forest that as I was saying occurs in the in Mexico and it reaches its northern limit in Sonora in the northwestern Mexico and in this site no work from uh, the from the dissertation of Nidia Rojas basically we have instrumented as a, a successional gradient you know, uh, of tropical dry forests where a nearly succession, a, a secondary succession and a mature forest have been studied through time you know, to uh, assess ecosystem fluxes in this site, to try to come to come up with a story of how these anthropogenic changes, you know, these land use changes, and then the succession have affected these uh, CO2 and water fluxes. Uh, in this site, media, the, the group has instrumented three our sites within a range of about two and a half kilometers in, in the area, you knowing a very fragmented landscape, but with remnants of, of mature forest, which is what we're showing as an OG and old growth. So in this site, uh, the Eddie Covariance has been going since 2015, and Nidia's work found very interesting things. Uh, there is an important difference on how the fluxes occur in this site. Uh, early succession and secondary succession of these are actively growing forests. The, nat the medical system production is high. You know, there is a net carbon gain every year in this forest, but surprisingly, the old growth forest is a part, it seems to be a net source of CO2 as the, as the, as the forest is aging. There is uh, obviously a bunch of questions that are open and we're still investigating why is this pattern is, 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 is occurring. You can visit Nidia's uh, poster. There's going to be a poster session, I think it's on, on Wednesday. Uh, so where you can uh, discuss with her or with us uh, more details on this, on this experiment. And this, we're actively uh, preparing the databases and the, and the site to upload the information to the Ameriflux database. For now, the old growth site is what it, we're working on. We're still on the process for the early succession and the secondary succession uh, data set. And finally, just to give another perspective of the opportunities and how exciting it is to work in the Northwestern Mexico in terms of fluxes, I want to point at this work that we've also been carried in combination with the University of Sonora, where we have instrumented a pair site. This is also historic data, where we instrumented um, a two mangrove ecosystems, one that is in a quite pristine area, not towards the northern part of the country, near Isla Tiburón, which is an awesome place that you need to visit if you want to get to know the Sonoran Desert. And then another one laying right a few kilometers from where I am right now, right by the Jackie Valley, which is highly impacted by anthropogenic activities, no uh, agricultural drainages hit these uh, estuaries, and those uh, appear, seem to be having an effect on the on the carbon and water fluxes, which is what we see in these bottom graphs, you know, one of the sites the more pristine side, the more preserved side is a stronger CO, both are, are net CO2 sources, but uh, the more preserved side is a stronger, um, a stronger uh, sink of carbon. And of course, there is a bunch of questions open, but we believe that all these agricultural drainages that exacerbate ecosystem perhaps, it's uh, attenuating the potential of carbon sequestration from these mangroves. And finally, some probably the latest uh, 
uh, a meriflux site that has been reported in Mexico from the leadership of Dr. Azul Sanchez. Uh, this is a, a floating uh, tower that is trying to understand the CO2 dynamics of an estuary, an active estuary that has a good part of the year uh, a, a healthy layer of uh, seagrasses. So this is a, a, a project that is just taking off, starting, but uh, Zulia is making a, a great job on trying to understand this very, very complex uh, system that we have. I mean, and see, just I'm pretty much done. Thanks. And uh, with that, I really want to uh, thank the organization. Uh, we're here again because we really want to commit with the Ameriflux community with the data that is coming from Mexico. We do believe that bridging the Americas needs the participation of Mexico, and we're going to be doing our best effort to. Uh, to, to be on board on this uh, initiative. And with that, um, I leave questions and I'll be here today and tomorrow. I notice there is a bar in the in the gathering so we can meet there and chat about the uh, Mexican sites and fluxes uh, through the next few days. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Enrico, um, great presentation. There is a question here from uh, Russ Scott uh, says, uh, um, have you looked at longer term trends in uh, gross primary productivity or net ecosystem productivity using satellite estimates like MODIS, NPV, or NDVI for the old growth forest in this region to see if the uh, recent net carbon losses are recent or over longer term? Hello, Ross. No, we have not done so. We've done some informal attempts, nothing serious. Have been, I will be dying to have a student that would like to jump at that is certainly a good way to uh, to approach this these questions that these towers are still on so we also hope to gather more more data but definitely some historic satellite work will help us to to frame better the what we're seeing in terms of the co2 sourcing that we're seeing in the old growth forest but uh, let's talk about that <laughs> Okay, uh, Carlos Guerra says, uh, it is uh, not too much rain on those places since I saw the open system. Uh, basically in the range of uh, the tropical dry forest has about 700 millimeters, the subtropical forest around 540 and the, the mangrove system, for example, goes down to 100 millimeters. So I, I guess I didn't mention that, but we do also have of a, a rainfall gradient. We don't get to the thousands at all in this part of the country. It's really confined by the North American monsoon season, but it's certainly very variable across years. We have time for one more question. I don't see any at the panel. Oh, here's one. Uh, has there been any effort to compare these uh, flux observations against global grid data sets yet? Nope, not yet. Uh, you know, we're still on the process of gathering the actual Mexican information. You know, even for me, it's still a bit overwhelming thinking nationwide. So, but we're like trying to push with the colleagues that are measuring fluxes and, you know, gathering the talent from our students to start pushing on these uh, directions. And uh, that's one, another reason why it's exciting to be on the Meriflux community because I'm sure we can learn uh, tricks and, 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 and ways to, to get to this type of analysis. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Enrico. We will uh, move to the next uh, presentation. It's a short talk by uh, Dr. Dan Stover and Gary Gibner. Uh, Dr. Dan Stover is the program manager for terrestrial ecosystem science programs in the Climate and Environmental Sciences Division of the Office of Biological and Environmental Research within the U.S. Department of Energy. He's the program manager of, for Ameriplax, which he has been uh, generously supporting for many years. Uh, Dr. Gary Gierner uh, is the director of the Climate and Environmental Sciences Division in the Office of Biological and Environmental Research of the U.S. Department of Energy. Their talk is uh, supporting an open path to the future of the Ameriflux uh, network. So you can see the screen down. Um, I will give you um, a warning when the, you have two minutes uh, left. Please go ahead. Mute myself there. 
Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm like um, I've been mentioned, uh, Dan Stover. I'm the program manager now at the environmental system science um, side of the program. And so I'll go through slides. Uh, first, I want to welcome everyone to the annual Ameriflux meeting. Um, it's great to see that there's been a large turnout given the all the restrictions and all the craziness of a pandemic. And so with this, let me hand it over to to our division director, Gary Gernard, to provide a couple of slides and a couple of introduction points. So, Gary. OK, thanks, everybody. I realize we're going to go fast today, but um, I wanted to have a couple of messages, and that is just to welcome everybody and thank everybody, especially who are calling in from many time zones away. So it's good morning and good evening to a lot of people. So before we start, I just wanted to give a summary of what our division uh, supports. And you can see our mission statement up there. I'm not going to read it because of our time, but we're focused mainly on advancing the predictability of the Earth system. This Ameriflux project is a key component of that. And what that really implies is that we have a long-term vested interest in making sure that this Ameriflux project is sustained and funded in the right way. So I thank everybody for at least um, doing what you've done so far because we wouldn't be here today without the success stories we've seen, but, but we do look forward to the future. Let's go on to the next slide, Dan. I think while Dan's pulling us up, there are a couple of messages in the next slides, and that is that with these grand challenges, water cycle, biogeochemistry, high latitudes, it goes across the board, but we try to identify new th projects that are cross-cutting. And one of those new projects, which we started this year, is a big coastal effort, which crosses a number of our challenges to span water cycle to biogeochemistry. There's a major modeling component. There's a major field activity component. But the intent here is, a, to, is to contrast between a, um, an oceanic coastal zone and also a lake coastal zone in, in the Great Lakes of the US. So this is one of the directions which, which we're heading. I know there's a later slide, which Dan is going to show, which illustrates that we're looking at mountainous watersheds also, so we can bridge the atmospheric sciences with watershed sciences and bringing our facilities to bear to make this a more complete uh, scientific endeavor so we could bridge across those disciplines. And the next slide, please, Dan. Uh, this is just to mention, uh, this is the last slide I'm gonna present before I hand back to Dan, but we had some additions to the division during this past year. We hired Jennifer Arrigo to be uh, a new program manager in the environmental system sciences portfolio. Sujing Davis in the lower left is a new program manager for our, let's say the large scale earth system modeling, especially the development piece, which focuses in large part on uh, exascale computing. Uh, Jeff Stair on the lower right is uh, a new addition to our atmospheric system research program. And on the upper left is Brian Benscotter, who is an IPA, which means he's a one year appointed program manager from a university with a possible extension for a second year. But this really constitutes the new additions to our team. And uh, I think you will, you'll be hearing more and more from these people as you visit other PI meetings. But I think several of these uh, new program staff are actually on this call today. I think at this stage, I'm gonna hand it back to Dan and thank everybody for this PI meeting. I think this is exciting. I love the international flair and uh, Thank you all for joining, especially those of you in, let's say, Central Asia or East Asia, because it is in the middle of the night for you guys, while well, at least the sun is up for us. Thanks, everybody. I'll pass it back. Hey, thanks, Gary. So um, in the, the time we have left, I'll give a little bit of an update on the, um, the Environmental System Science Program. And for those in the community that aren't aware, starting on October 1, which began fiscal year 2021, um, represented um, some change in within our division, some changes. Um, the Terrestrial Ecosystem Science Program and the subsurface biogeochemical research activities within our office were combined to form a single program called Environmental System Science. Um, the new program moving forward, we've been working on this uh, for the past year, thinking about what it means to, to combine these two programs together. 
and and how that's going to impact and change our, our vision and our goals. And so you can see here, this is kind of our our first public slide that we have related to to this new ESS program with the goal to advance an integrative, robust, and scale-aware predictive understanding of terrestrial systems and their interdependent biological, chemical, ecological, hydrological, and physical processes. Um, and again, with the objective of the program is to integrate, you know, using a systems approach, an integrated framework, um, try to unravel the complex processes and controls and the structure, function, and feedbacks and dynamics of these terrestrial ecosystems. Um, very similar that uh, I'm sure that you, those that have been aware of our program before, you know, the, the, the scope of our program kind of goes from the bedrock through the rhizosphere and vegetation all the way to the atmospheric interface um, and encompasses watersheds, coastal zones, terrestrial aquatic interfaces, um, very much the, the types of processes and the, the areas that we've worked in before and trying to get them into earth system models. Um, I won't go through this slide very in a lot of detail, but I think it's important that in our general approach that, you know, what frames the investment that we make here really is MODEX. And this is coupling models and experiments together. And it's this open data science, open source uh, philosophy, which resonates through the Ameriflux. And as you'll see through the, the first bullet point there, which says observational networks is one of the many ways in which we help coordinate and Ameriflux represents that. So looking forward, a few things that are coming up on our on our radar um, over the next year or two. One is uh, DOE um, through the Atmospheric Radiation Measurement User Facility or ARM facility. Um, a proposal was submitted through the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory called CELL. This is the Surface Atmosphere Integrated Field Laboratory. Um, this will be in a watershed in the uh, uh, East River in, in Colorado, where the, uh, the former subsurface biogeochemical program has a long history of, of working. Um, the ARM facility will be moving one of their mobile facilities there. Um, it has a lot of potential links to, to Ameriflux. Um, that particular campaign um, aims uh, from the Cell website says that it's to profoundly advance scientific understanding of the major atmospheric physical processes and this land atmosphere interaction impacting how mountainous watersheds in the Rocky Mountains deliver water. And so I know there was a workshop just a week or two ago that Dan Feldman had, had led from Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Um, and there's a lot of interest, I think, for them to get the Ameriflux community involved in this. And so if you're not aware of this, there's a website there um, on this slide, and I encourage you to, to take a look and contribute where you can. Um, probably the most important thing most people are going to ask is, you know, hey, what's, you know, what are options or opportunities for funding? Um, we currently have a draft of a, uh, a new funding opportunity that's hopefully that, that's in the process of being approved. Um, that we're hoping to be released sometime before the end of this calendar year. So stay tuned for that. I can't talk specifics about what the topics are. They're embargoed, but stay tuned. We do have something coming coming out soon that I think would be relevant to the to the Ameriflux community. Looking forward, um, much like Trevor said earlier, this is your community, um, and so you know the path forward for Ameriflux is is uh, needs needs some things to happen. And the most important thing you can do to help keep in the community on this, this forward path um, is to get involved. Serve on a committee. Um, I know Margaret and Trevor and the Ameriflux Management Program Group are actively looking for people to serve on committees, lead a synthesis, be a mentor, work on workshops, um, you know, help with early career. There's lots of opportunities. It's just, you know, it's, it's how do you want to how do you want to serve the committee and, and serve the community rather and and, and participate. Um, Ameriflux just wrapped up its year of methane. Trevor talked about this earlier this morning. Um, that year of methane, I think, was was pretty exciting, and I think Ameriflux will be doing many more of these going forward. So, you know, there's still time to participate in activities like this. Um, collaborations are really important moving forward. Um, make sure that you actively engage our growing network of sites and, and partner sites, and this includes, you know, the partnerships that we've grow we've been developing over the years with the Neon community. With ICOS, with with Brazil Flux and, and Asia Flux, and all the different Flux communities, um, you know, collaboration is the key there. Um, and participate in those communities. You know, serve on the committees, lead synthesis. Again, it's 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 the same thing. It's it's that this is how this is how we move this community forward um, for the next 20 years. Um, one thing that I ask that that you do as part of this the Ameriflux community is is continue to make diversity. Um, equity, inclusion, and a safe work environment part of our culture. Um, don't forget to include psychological safety and harassment prevention as part of your operational plans. Um, there's a website there that'll take you to DOE's um, research conduct policies, including things with diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
um, and scientific integrity. So um, I encourage everyone to think about not just the you know band aids and boo boos type of things that we do in the field, but you know inclusion and 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 psychological safety as part of our our, our operating culture moving forward. Um, and then on behalf of DOE, I just want to, you know, to, to say congratulations to the, the Berkeley Lab team for a successful renewal for five more years of the Ameriflex Management Project. Um, they're really doing an outstanding job fostering our community and, and encouraging growth and, and leading us, helping, you know, helping enable everyone to, to plot the future of the Ameriflex community. Um, they've been supporting an increase in the number of tele, you know, a number of uh, network sites in QATC. The, 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 the number of sites in the, in the community have just grown dramatically over the last uh, 10 years. And that's, I give a lot of credit to, to Margaret and the team to, to really work with people to bring, bring people on board. Uh, the number of QATC um, site visits have been increasing. Um, that's going to be uh, an interesting challenge for the community now that we have so many more sites. You know the data processing, the the rapid response systems, and equipment loans, um, the international uh, networking, and, and engaging the neon community. It's it's all been top notch, and I and I give a lot of kudos to this team, and and on behalf of the community, thank them for all the work that they're doing. Um, but like like always, they're always working hard to find new ways to help the community, to develop the community's leadership, and increase the participation of of particularly early career scientists. So. Um, engage with them. If you have a need, engage with with you know with the AMP team and and work with them. They'll be happy to to, to help you and and help figure out ways because they're only as effective as as the needs of the community. So if, if you don't talk to them, they don't know how to how best to serve the community. And so Can with that, I will and ask questions. Oh, perfect, perfect timing then. <laughs> I was just telling you you have uh, two more minutes. Um, so um, we'll open it for questions for for Dan. Hello. Yes, uh, Bruno Marino. Yes. Um, what is the rate of expansion? on the EC towers for Ameriflot, say per year? I would have to defer that question to Margaret or Trevor to actually know the, the, the number of sites per year, what would be the average? Um, I'm just curious, that's fine, thank you. Hey, this is uh, Trevor. We are expanding about 10% over the last year in the number of sites registered. Um, and that was 20% last year. So we're growing at a pretty steady clip. Well, Trevor, um, how many units does that translate into? Um, could you clarify what you mean by units? Well, how many observation platforms are set up a new um, on average every year? Oh, so that is... Um, we're currently at about 515 sites registered. So that translates that the past year over 50 sites. Um, I'd encourage you to go to the Ameriflex website where we have something called Network at a Glance. And you can see all of the statistics of the network and how many, how it's changing over time as well. Thank you, I'll do that, Trevor. So Ben Runkel, uh... As a question, do you see any traction for increasing funds uh, for the environmental system science program for the DOE uh, budget to increase? So that's that's a tough one, given that we're currently working under a continuing resolution. So we don't know. There's not there hasn't been a, a decision made on the fiscal year 21 budget. Um, the plan moving forward at this stage is that the TES and the SBR budgets would just be combined. Um, so assuming a flat flat budget. Um, those two, those two numbers will just be combined, which I think comes up to be like a hundred and uh, like 125 million dollars of program dollars um, between between both programs. Well, and the Environmental and Molecular Sciences Laboratory as well. Um, Gary, I don't know if you're still on 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 the phone and would like to respond to that as well. Gary may have had to jump off. So, um, uh, but we do have we do have plans. Us, to, to um, are there new programs to interact with Canada and Latin America? Um, 
so you know what new programs for Canada and Latin America um, there's nothing specific that I would say aside from the work that Margaret and and the Ameriflex management network you know and the engagements that they're doing um, in terms of new ways to interact is that our funding opportunities are not US centric so you know some agencies have limitations of where they can you know where they can support or solicit uh, proposals from but there are no limitations to, to DOE at least in the office of science at this point so when we released a funding announcement, you know, we, I've received proposals before from, from Europe. I've seen proposals from Australia, New Zealand that have applied to the FOAs before um, anyone can apply to them. Um, there's, there's, no, there's no restriction. So if there are folks from you know, Canada or Latin America that would like to apply when the funding announcement comes out, um, you know, there is a pre-app process where they have to, we do review pre-apps and we encourage or discourage um, um, you know, the, the from a proposal to be submitted into the program. But other than that, anyone, you know, everyone's allowed to to participate in the uh, in the funding opportunity. Okay, uh, thank you, Dan and Gary. Our time is up for um, this presentation. And with this, uh, we close the first um, plenary session, bringing the Americas together. And uh, now I'll pass it um, to uh, Josh Fisher. Uh, who will um, 